CRISPR, but you have to target the, uh, the gene that's involved in making the pigment. Then, yeah, you can use it. Yeah, that'd be pretty cool. All right, guys, so today we're going to talk about replication. Um, for this one, I know you guys are going to read the book. Yeah. All right, so. Remember, we're thinking about bacteria. We're going to be some of the examples we're going to be talking about. The big thing with them that I want you guys to think about is that the bacteria, they have that, there's genome is smaller and it's also switching. So when we're talking DNA, there's going to be some things that we need to worry about them that are special with bacteria. On the other side, for us, for the eukaryotes, for us, what we're going to be thinking about is going to be more like chromosomes, right? So in this case, I want you to be thinking. Uh, Small circuit discs. For us, it's going to be large and it's linear. Right? It's going to be like four times, five times, three times, five times. So, in the book, they're basically coming up with the different strategies on how we're going to copy the DNA. Um, in the beginning, they both kind of have the same, it's a very similar strategy. Once you start getting near the ends, as you can see, let's say this one starts copying, you start making double stranded, double stranded, double stranded. As you go to the edges, we're going to have to deal with how we copy the edges. For this one, once we're opening this DNA up, it's going to have the issue that's going to run into each other. So that's where we're going to separate talking about the two mechanisms. In the book, 
they give these different names. The way I remember them is that the factors that are involved here, like the polymerase, they have numbers one, two, and three. In this case, for us, the polymerase had, um, I think it's alpha, delta, epsilon. Right? So this is going to be my best drawing for you. And here is polymerase one, two, and three. As we go through them, we'll, we'll talk a little bit about for them. I want you guys to kind of pay attention to what kind of functions they do. So, all three polymerases they make DNA. Right? Normally, they have they have to use a, something to guide them. So they'll have one strand that they'll kind of clamp onto. And it'll be that this will be where they attach the second set of bases to. So they need to be able to read something. As we go through your notes, through the lecture today, you go through your notes. I want you to emphasize that some of the things use DNA as a guide, and in that case, they're called DNA-dependent DNA polymerases. In other cases, they can use RNA as their guide, like the before everything you're seeing these from. And that'll be like an RNA-dependent DNA polymerase. The other jobs that these polymerases can do is that, if you imagine two strands, and as you're going and copying from the five times to the three times, adding base pairs, some of them have this thing with their exonuclease. If they see that there's a piece of DNA in front of them, they can actually kick that piece of DNA off so that they can put in their copy, right? So exonuclease ability means that they can kick things out. Some of them work in only specific directions. All of them don't be like to proofread, which is if you're going forward, you make an error, you can go back and kick off, kick off these bases to be like, okay, I got messed up. I made a uh, other ones, when they're going forward, there's something to wait to kick things off. Yeah. So, I'm gonna go pretty fast, but I want you guys to, when we come back, to add those notes to make up your little table about polymerase one, two, three, that uh, alpha, sorry, alpha gamma, no, alpha delta epsilon, and then tell me what the role is about copying DNA and whether they can get DNA in or out. I mean, from, uh, forward or back. All right, let's go. Um, so remember, for DNA replication, this is all gonna come in from the stuff we talked about last week, which is, we're normally going to be sitting at 2N, right? And as we're starting to enter the subdivision cycle, right, in the S phase, this is the time we're going to kick the, the replication off. So here's what we talked about the, the, the sequence of the TDKs that are present during that S phase. And basically, this will be starting with the replication. So this strategy is pretty much the same for both. There's going to be pieces of DNA that are going to have like a sequence on the DNA that's going to help us mark them. They're also going to have a protein complex that helps us recognize them. Then the goal is going to be to go from that double stranded DNA, opening it up. So you're going to have two single stranded pieces of, of, of DNA. At which point, you basically from there, you're going to start pushing your way out and just start copying that DNA. Right? As you're doing that, what's going to end up happening is that. You're going to have two strands, right? And this is called, um, this one is, it's, a, it's like there was like different strategies and ways that the DNA can, can get replicated. And you're thinking about like the blue ones being your old strand and these green ones being your new strands, right? When you're making copies of your molecule, you'll start like this, two old strands. And as it opens up, right, and it's doing its replication, you're producing a new strand company. So let's say this was our five to three. We're also gonna make our second strand. In this case, it's the opposite strand, right? This one starts at the three prime, goes to the five prime, and it's gonna have its own brand new partner like that. So when you end up with two, two, new, DNA, two new DNA complexes, you're gonna have an old strand, and you're also gonna have a new strand when they come out. Here, when they were first trying to figure this out, they, some people thought that they were like replicating them in chunks and somehow it would put back together. Some of the people thought that somehow they would completely copy each other and then the two green ones would go and become a group and the two pink ones would become a different group. But this is the way it does it. Right? One old strand, one brand new strand. Once you get through this elongation, so it means you just keep going and then we're do all the job. At the end of it, remember, when we start jumping out of cell division again now, you have two copies. This is where for us, we grab them from the centromeres and we pull them apart. And at which point you give one copy to one cell and you give one copy to the other one. So we're looking pretty good where we're at, the process is going on. All right. Now let's zoom into it and see what's actually going on inside. The quiz. 
All right, so for this, you know, they're going to use that same kind of terminology they love an initiation step, an elongation step, and a termination step. Like I said, initiation, normally they're pretty similar. It's a piece of DNA we're going to go target, and we're going to bring proteins to help us find it and open up the DNA. Or elongation is we're going to be the most efficient, most powerful thing to copy the DNA. And when we're done for termination, this is where we're going to have to figure out two different strategies to figure out how to deal with the circular plasma versus the linear one. Yeah. All right, so if it's really, really super, super zoom in. So in this case, I want you to talk a little bit about how the, um, the enzymes themselves work we, or the chemical reaction is happening as we're copying this, right? So here's my, uh, that drawing, right? This is our initial strand. That would be here, our orange one. That's your template strand. That'd be the old DNA molecule and we're trying to copy it. The polymerase, like um, polymerase, gamma, epsilon, and here I believe it's polymerase three, they have to be able to grab onto a double stranded piece of DNA as a base to land onto. Right? But their confirmation is like if they're doing their job, and let's imagine this is our double helix molecule, it has to be able to grab onto something where it's double stranded. And in front of it, it has to have a place where it'll be single-stranded so they can add the base pairs. They can't just land onto single-stranded DNA. So that's why for these, you need something to be like, it's a little bit of a primer. So some place where it's a land onto double-stranded DNA. Once it grabs on, the only way they can add bases, right, or polymerize a reaction, is you have to bring in the uh, triphosphate bases, so ATCG, right, ATCG, yeah, ATCG. When you're bringing them in, the, each molecule, this is your five prime side, right? Where your phosphates, on your three prime of that sugar, this is where you have your hydroxyl group. You glue only onto the three prime side and it can add the bases, you know? On that, on that side, technically if our blue strand was longer, it could technically be glue on that side. The issue with this is when we open this up, right? Let's go this one for now. This opens up with that. This one will open up like that. Five prime, to three prime, to five prime, to three prime. The strand that you're going to be making in here has to be reverse complement. If this one's five to three prime going that way, the primer would be right here, five prime to three prime, right? Because we have the three prime open, that means that hey, we can keep adding bases to it. That makes sense. On this side, if, for example, we decided to work. Again, just on this front side, you can see that here, if we put a primer here, because this one will end up being five prime and three prime on that side, technically we couldn't be able to add bases on that side. So how do you show this guy? Does that make sense? All right, because you couldn't basically work itself backwards. So this is one of the big problems that the cells are going to face because we can only grow in one direction, and that's towards the three prime. As a preliminary. Yeah, so on this one, add it to your notes. So the DNA polymerase only acts as a um, like a catalyst in the five prime to direction. It's going to go back and forth. It's going to cool. All right. So that's how the polymerase works. Now let's see how he's going to set up, or they're going to set up to initially open things up. So in this case, we have this origin recognition or origin recognition complex, the um, ORC, and there it's going to be recognizing that first piece of DNA. So that's going to be our uh, ORI. -O -R -I. So right here, this piece of DNA, ORI. So this DNA, and it basically has a special sequence. Right? So it's going to be a pattern that's going to help bring in the protein complex. The ORC, that's the protein complex that recognizes that DNA and say, hey, this is what we're going to start opening the DNA up. For this one, I remember we went pretty heavy into it last week, right? When we were talking about you're going to recruit this protein complex called the MCM. Right? So they're going to be initially dropped off and they're going to be like on sleep mode. They're not fully activated. They bind to the outer edges. You're going to see we're going to have two of them. Then we're going to have signaling coming from signaling E and signaling B. And these molecules then help bring in these two little bit, these two helpers the, uh, the delta DDK from signaling E. And the other one was um, like GMS or something. Yes. 
genes, GINs. That's the other molecule. So these are the genes. Once these molecules get phosphorylated, they come in, and basically they build a bigger complex all together. So now when you have your MCM, your genes, and your CD45, that's the, of the signal that says, hey, you're ready to go. Start opening up the DNA. At which point, when you're at this phase, they end up opening up the complex, and they start making us this thing here. Right? We still have double strands out the edges, but it's open like this. As they start moving forward, what they do is they grab this double stranded DNA and they're going to open it up pretty nice like this going forward. Right? And as it keeps going forward more and more, it just keeps opening up. And you're actually going to be opening it up from two different sides. One DNA case is going to go this way, there's going to be another set of DNA cases that are only this way. No? So that's just to open up the DNA going there. There's going to be another big player, which is going to be the, the next one. Give me one second, guys. Here's a little bit more of a complex drawing, but it's the exact same thing. We're bringing in the heat cases, right? We're going to have gins, CDC45, those are two big guys that are going to modify it. We're going to bind it. Now we're going to have it in the active phase. Now it's going to be one to open up the DNA. It holds on to one strand. And as it's opening up the DNA, what's going to happen is you're going to have the other strand be single stranded. Nobody's single stranded DNA. It's not happy. It's not stable. That's where this big player comes in the single stranded DNA binding protein. Right? So, those will basically hold on to that single strand, stabilize it a little bit. So, as you're moving forward, our heme case will be here doing its job. And it basically, they're on this side, just temporarily holding on. To that single strand of DNA before you start copying. Okay. You. As you do that, the next big players are going to come in. It's going to be the first is going to be the it's called clamp loading protein. Let me go to that one real quick. So that's this guy. It's going to be the one in orange. Its only job is to bring in the sliding one. So what this does is that plant is going to hold on to the, on to the DNA molecule. This one's going to burn energy. The whole point is you bring it onto this onto the DNA molecule. It literally wraps around where you want it to be your DNA case. Right? So your DNA, it should be sitting around there like that. The goal of that is that you basically have a mechanism to anchor you to the, polymeric, to the DNA you're trying to copy. This one is going to interact with our DNA polymerase. And through that protein protein interaction, it's this ends up holding the polymerase onto the DNA that it's supposed to be copying. So it doesn't want to just fall off or stop copying, right? So that kind of almost depends on like it's putting it on a rail system. So, yeah, we set the clamp, sorry, uh, clamp loading protein. Then we're going to hit the sliding pan. That's going to help us recruit our polymerase. At which point, now the polymerase can basically start copying the strand that it's responsible. So it'll be pushing on its table, moving forward. This is where it's very easy on one side, right? When our primer is set up, we're going from the three primer copying DNA, everything's good. The problem is what's happening with this other strand down here? This is the one that's a little bit of a pain in the butt. So for this one, we have to do a little bit something more fancy. So for this, now we're going to separate these two strands into two different names. In the dark blue, you have your old piece of DNA. It was double stranded, and now we've set up this whole complex and we've opened it up, right? So, again, our heme case came in here with, uh, you know, to open it up. Um, we also have like our, our single binding proteins that are holding up the other strand temporarily to have this thing open. On the easy side, when you open it, you can see this is five prime, three prime for the blue one is here, but that means that we can go from five prime on the baby blue side to the three prime. Super easy. Literally, it's just the molecule just keep moving forward, dropping bases, no problem. It can keep going until it's done. On the opposite strand, we're going to have the issue now that the only way we can make DNA from five prime to three prime is we would, we would need to bind the molecules here and make the DNA get inserted for in that orientation. Right. So with that, the issue is like if you imagine it, when you open it up, we're displaying more and more of the five prime side. So we can't glue from that side. So here you're going to have to use a little bit of more tools to get this side to work. 
You know, so it's going to be like our elongation steps. So for this one, they call it the leading strand because it's going fast. At the bottom one, this one going backwards. They call it the lagging strand. You know. So for this one, we're going to go through. Let me get my this ready. We're going to go through a little bit of series of complexes, right? First one, because. Again, our polymerase has to be grabbing off the double stranded DNA, double stranded um, nucleotides to be able to add things. The first thing that has to come in is going to be a primase to give us a little bit of a primase. This will be temporarily an RNA molecule, right? This will cramp on, grab onto our DNA, make it double stranded. At which point here, when we're talking about bacteria, they use, um, I think it's they use polymerase one, and we use uh, alpha. This then starts going, it makes a little bit of piece of DNA, at which point that'll be like 15, 20 base pairs, maybe another 10 or so by the DNA swarm, the um, polymerase one. After you have that little base started, it would be like the blue would be your DNA, that's your RNA. Then you can have the big players come in with polymerase, um, delta, and epsilon. In my notes, I have it that epsilon seems to be the big player up here. And the delta is the one that's normally functioning on this one. Now that you've done this stretch, you have your primer. This thing in between, normally that can be, I think it's a few hundred to a few thousand base pairs long. That's when you bring polymerase, like I said, it's either three or you bring in gamma, uh, gamma delta. These then can kind of go really fast on a lot of base pairs to fill in most of that gap between your primers. <coughs> So the end of the is you have to do this multiple times. Primer, primer, does sense you open it up a bit, throw it in primer, get the thing going. This is going to keep opening, and eventually you're going to put a primer here and then try to cover that region. Yeah. So as you do that, you're going to fill in this gap. But remember, at this point, you still have RNA molecule left behind that shouldn't be there. You literally have this weird molecule that has DNA, pieces of RNA, and then down the line, it's going to be this huge piece of DNA. So we shall not be happy. This is where DNA alpha, the polymerase alpha, or, or DNA one come back. And this is where they have that extra cool job that they can do, right? And one of them is here is that they are, um, oh, what's it called? I think it's, let's see, let's see. Yeah, these have five to three prime exonuclease activity, right? So as they're landing into these spots, when they get in here, they're actually help kind of kick off the old primer. So at one time they're doing a job of kicking up the kicking out RNA. The other thing is they can also work like polymerases and they start replacing those empty spots now with actual DNA. And at which point now you should be you should have the whole thing be double stranded DNA. The next big step is going to be here, which is when you get to the last little bit of polymerase, it adds the last nucleotide. The problem is that normally it, it, it uses the energy of the ATP or the GTP, the triphosphate, to make it glue itself to the next molecule. Because it can't bring in the next molecule, it doesn't have the power to glue itself to the, to the, to the previous side. At which point you have one more big helper, which is going to be your DNA ligase. This one will then grab that. Three prime hydroxyl group, that five prime phosphate, and bond them together. At which point you will have one continuous piece of double stranded DNA perfectly copied. Yeah. All right. Let me go this way. Let me go that way. How are you guys feeling about initiate, initiation and elongation of the polymerase? Feeling pretty good? If so let's say I gave you guys like a list of words, would you guys be able to put them in order and come to the story for it? Yeah, a little, okay, I want to see some, some uh, maybes, I'll take them. Um, I think that's going to be one of my big questions, but I'll play with it uh, next week. I might put it part, part of my quiz. So for here, it's going to be, again, the way I look at it is one, you have your helicase. So you guys will be talking about what are the complexes to make your helicase activity. Two, I have my sliding pad. So remember for this one, this is the big player, but you have the clamp loader that gets the job done. For three, 
Now I have my polymerase, which is going to be talking to DNA, at which point you have two different brackets. Right? If your polymerase is working with your leading strand, it's pretty simple, right? So leading. You're going to have one primer being made. You look at this little picture here, right? You only need one primer because everything is in order for him to just keep moving forward. The only thing that's literally slowing him down is the DNA not opening up fast enough for him to find. He literally just wants to go forward, right? So one primer, and then we have our our um, our polymerase one, and just copy, 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 right? That's all it's doing. Opposite to that, or the opposite one is going to be your lagging strand. This is the one we're going to have to go into a little bit more steps, right? So here it's the helicase opens it up. First thing are going to be your single stranded uh, DNA, DNA binding protein, right? They're going to temporarily hold that molecule. So you have this like loose piece of single stranded DNA not trying to curl into itself, not acting, not doing anything funny not getting cut up by the proteins. After that, you're gonna bring in your primer, right? Remember, you're gonna to have to do this like a huge number of times. Right? You're gonna need a bunch of little primers, getting spaced out, dropping off the little fragments you're gonna copy. After you bring your primers, it's your, your, um, your delta or your polymerase, Polymerase three. Right. So eukaryotes, bacteria, they're going to start filling it in. They'll get us most of the flu away here. After that, we need to bring in, we need to get rid of the RNA. So you might also put exonuclease for the RNA. And then you have your whole, whole one refill, or like, um, and then finally, the last big guy is going to be your ligase. Yeah. You guys feeling pretty good about that? All right, so this is the way you're going to be setting it up. When you're doing the copying, make sure you guys tell the difference between the name of the two strands and how you're going to have to work slightly different to get these guys to keep working. Yeah. Um, because they're symmetrical, I really don't have to go into, into it, but what you can see is that once you open up a piece of DNA, we're going to end up copying this way, going that way. You're going to have another set of molecules working on this side, going this way, right? So when we open up in the middle, now you can see that the top strand is going to have the lagging strand, the, the, lagging, the lagging strand working on that side, and we're going to have the leading strand on this side, right? So every way, when you open up the, the first ORI, in one direction, you're going to have one fast and one like skip or like um, jumping one. In the other direction, same thing. One fast one, the other one has to be jumping and making little fragments. All right. And for primers, it has to be a lot of primers for the lagging strand. Yes. So, what is it? Our bases are like 10 to the 9, right? Like that's a crazy number. That's how long we have to copy this thing. The, um, if I remember correctly, the, the fragments we're getting out of this one, like the gaps between these red things, are a few hundred. And I feel like my, in my head, my max is telling me like 50 kb at a time. So it's like, you know, you, you, you leave this piece of DNA opened up for a bit, but you can't be too crazy and let this thing be too big. So every three, I think every few hundred to a thousand bases, it kind of does a new primer, and gets copied, and then it keeps doing that over and over again. So you can have a huge genome, you can do it a lot of times. Yeah. Um, but that being said, like when you zoom into it and see how it's working, like as a protein complex, it's, it's like super, super fancy and looks super cool. So for this, if we go back to kind of like our overall story, what's going on, here I want you to imagine it like our old DNA is up there, right? Here's our helicase helping open this thing up. It's going to open the piece of DNA. When it's doing that, here you have your uh, your clamp loader. There are your clamps. On this side, because it's the fast way to do it, you're growing DNA from five prime to three prime. 
you load up your client and your preliminaries one time, and basically it just goes off. You literally hold on to the DNA, you post copy, 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 because it won't stop. On this side, here you have to go through that whole task, right? Get a primer set up for it. It's going to be down here. The blue thing is going to be the primer. Bring in your DNA, or uh, sorry, bring in your clamp, bring in the preliminaries, and then you start copying it this way. At which point, remember here, we have to get rid of the old primer. We got to fill in the gap, and we're going to line it. And it's going to be doing this process over and over. You let the thing stretch out, grabs onto the thing again. The cool thing is because the clamp holds on also to your preliminaries, it can literally, um, it doesn't let it go, so it doesn't slow you down like having to recapture a brand new preliminary from like the environment. It like it just has it nearby to the here. So it'll help a lot because otherwise this thing would like super slow it down. All right. Everyone pretty 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 good about copying DNA? Yeah. All right. <clears throat> so the next part we're gonna be talking about. This is where it's going to be a little bit different for both. So for the eukaryote and the carrot, for the material, the material, it's going to be that. When we're copying this, when we get to the end, and here what you're going to see is we're going to actually run into ourselves. Right? But in this case, as we're copying these strands going out, we're going to end up getting to the end, and you see it's going to be a little bit difficult to capture. So if you look at this one first, I want you to imagine when we're copying this, we came all the way across, and we just copied the other side here. And these, these two, Different trains are about to run into each other. So for this, um, the picture got I got it from a different place, so the colors are a little bit different. So these red ones are the helicases, right? So they're the yellow ones from this picture back here. Right. Remember the helicases, the ones that open up the DNA. That's for shortness here would be these red ones. So these will be the two helper proteins that get activated. And what we do, what they do is when they're coming across the whole circle and they get to the back side and they bump into each other, these basically get tagged with ubiquitin, right? So from earlier, remember, tag things with ubiquitin, the bigger it gets, that's what's gonna send it to get it degraded, right? Um, it's, uh, the surprising thing for this one is that it doesn't do, uh, do that exact mechanism, but what it does is that that ubiquitin tag serves as a way to get it kicked off the complex it doesn't actually degrade the component. So it just literally structurally affects the protein structure. At which point, you're kicking off the helicases. What's going to end up happening is these two bubbles trying to grow, copy the DNA, bump into each other, and they basically force each other to fall off. At which point, the polymerase copy their last little pieces, and then the two little circle, circular paths of DNA actually unplug from each other, and then you have two separate strands of DNA, right? Two double stranded circular pieces. So this is the simple one. Not too bad, they basically fall off. Then for us, for the chromosomes, this is a little bit more of a, it's like a, it's a process. So I'm gonna talk through it and I want you guys to kind of make your own little table as I go through it, writing down what are the critical components for this one. So this one is, is I want you to imagine we're like super zoomed in and all we care about is literally exactly what's happening right here and what's happening right here, right? So the last little bit. I'm going to say we're imagining we're looking at this side over here. So when you're looking at the last little bit, the preliminaries came, it's, it's able to, to copy DNA five to three prime side, right? The problem is the last little bit, you can see here we're missing a little piece. So this would be like near your telomeres, right? Near the end of the of the of your chromosome, there's going to be little pieces like this where you can't really fill them in. You don't have double stranded DNA on this side that'll let you glue, glue itself to the three prime to grow this way, right? So it's like technically it's impossible to fill that up. So this is where this telomeres are going to help us. So it's a complex between the uh, so primase makes an RNA model, an RNA primer, but it builds a complex with this protein, this telomerase, right? What it's going to do is it uses this blue one would be our RNA guide, like Gaden's here. It kind of matches up to the end of the, of the sequence of the chromosome. Now it behaves almost like a template, right? At this point, we use the polymerase function. We bring in extra bases. You can see we stretch out this other side from five prime to three prime, which is the way we can add DNA. So now instead of being at the old end, we can start making this a little bit longer. Right. So now we've stretched out what pieces we consider the end, at which point we use the techniques 
that we use back here, right? Which is we bring in a primer, we bind it out here, right? The RNA primers get made, sorry, the primer gets made, attaches here. Now you have double stranded E in it, and you have a, a gap to fill, right? And then this is where you can bring in the polymerase, you can clamp onto this and start adding bases and moving forward. It'll fill in the, 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 the gap that we're missing or the sequence, at which point it fills it all the way in. And then here you bring in that ligase to help glue it back into the next molecule. Yeah. So in this way, this process gets repeated over and over. So when you're replicating your DNA, you basically have this like cushion at the outer edges that doesn't have critical genes, but it's just this multiple copies of the exact same sequence over and over. So here you can see this pattern of TT4Gs, TT4Gs. This thing's gonna happen like several hundred times at the end of, of, your, of, your, uh, of your telomeres. As we get older, we actually, the size of the thing gets smaller and smaller, right? So it gets harder for it to copy it. Eventually the, the thought is kind of like, the people who have defects in the ability to maintain their telomeres, it's the DNA start getting in a way, they kind of die at a very young age or they age really fast because they, their cells start losing information from the coming in, right? So you start hitting the critical parts of the chromosome. So this is super important. In cancer cells that live forever, and in, I think in tumors, they find this telomerase function is like super high. So having the ability to keep your telomeres super long basically really helps the cells kind of replicate, and it like lets them withstand a lot of division. So I think that's something that we potentially target. Is so that pretty good about the clinician for this guy? Telomeres, yeah. So primer is actually just like DNA itself. It's not. So the primer for this case. It's an RNA primer. So it's like a series of nucleotides. It's yeah. not an enzyme. Not Correct. Yeah. So for that one, I didn't write down the name for this one. You might have to look it up for me. It's saying primers and it's saying DNA G. So yeah, I think it's gonna be like a polymerase G, but I would say double check that one, look it up. So it'll be again the enzyme, the primers will be sitting here, grab onto the DNA, and it'll start it'll start adding the sequences onto it. But the molecules it's adding are gonna be RNA molecules. So I didn't put any use in here to kind of help it make it more clear. Yeah, that should be an RNA molecule. And again, same thing. You can have an RNA, RNA DNA complex. Our cells are going to be like, we don't want that. We want it to be all DNA. So you're going to have the things have to come back. If this will happen multiple times, if this one was one of the internal versions, it will get cured up. Same thing like we did back here, right? We'll get rid of the primer. We'll fill it in. That's only if you have extra DNA at the top, right? Um, the last little bit. This would happen is the last last one doesn't because you remove the RNA, you get this, and then this thing will be in the top. Yeah. All right. So termination, you guys are feeling pretty good. All right, there's only one thing I forgot to bring up, which was what's going on with stress as we're as we're moving forward. Let's get a picture. I'll use this one. All right, so, so there's one more factor that's kind of helping on the other side, so in front of the DNA. So right now your DNA is basically coiled up into itself, right? It's going to be strolled up. As this molecule is moving forward and opening them up to make your two strands, right? Like this. It's basically going to start twisting this more and more every time. So the more we move forward, it's gonna make this, this, this curves kind of compress on each other. At which point you're gonna get some things like, they're gonna start getting super cold into themselves like that, right? The more you open it up, the more tangled it gets. The problem with this tangled DNA is like, if you get it so tangled, it won't let you move forward. 
there's going to be two types of topoisomerases, and basically they're DNA cutters. Topoisomerase number, where's this guy? Yeah, number two is, is going to be the, the big uh, the big player here. What he can do is it'll actually go up in front of the port. It'll do a double stranded break. It'll cut the DNA. At which point this this thing this can unravel itself. Right? It goes loose like it loses the knot, and then it glues them back together. That way you can kind of reduce the stress in front. Because you're also doing this kind of twist where you're you're kind of like you're putting it off, like kind of mess up almost with a spring, you kind of untwist it. The other thing you have is you have topoi summarize one, and what that one can do is you can reduce the stress on individual strands. So topoi summarize one is just as one piece of DNA. So it's double stranded, it cuts one, lets it kind of like pull on itself, and then you can put it back in. Yeah. Um, those would be really important to kind of relieve the stress, and then you should have pretty good copy. Um, all right, cool. So for this one, my challenge to you guys is the polymerases for eukaryotes, alpha, um, delta, epsilon. I want a table telling me about in what orientation they add DNA and what orientation they can either take away DNA or they can take away RNA. And I want you guys to see that they have basically two different functions. Yeah? Cool. Or any other questions? It's not due on Friday. What? The, you said the table. Oh. It's, for, it's for your midterm. Okay. Yeah. So that's my thing. I'm like, if you make that table, it'll really help you out. Just like in your study thing. Kind of like I, I made the table for the um, for the G0, G1, G2 thing. Mm -hmm. um, I started glancing at you guys' uh, group projects, like the, the PowerPoints, and I saw you guys did pretty good on bringing those tables over and trying to clarify things. So I think if you guys make your own tables, it might help you like submit the ideas. Yeah. With your summary, when you say DNA from race one, do you also mean like DNA from race alpha? Yeah. And then where would the epsilon come in? So epsilon. On my notes, it's telling me that epsilon it's used in the mean strand, and then the uh, delta is being used in the lagging strand. So we'll go with that. I'm, I, I, it's uh, but in their pictures, I see they do a lot of this, like they put both of them together. Mm -hmm. So from my notes, it's telling me it should be the opposite. Like this one should be the delta, and then that one should be epsilon. So when you wrote there, like one primer DNA polymerase one copy, you mean like one primer DNA polymerase epsilon copy? Is it a one? Good catch. So which is the one that does the main jobs? So that is polymerase three is the big player. And this is, in this case, it would be our, our epsilon, right? So, for us and then for bacteria. Good count. Thank you. And then for that one, you put DNA polymerase 3 as the delta. You mean, is that, do you still, like, is that still accurate? Yeah. Yeah. So this is our lagging okay. strand, right? We're talking about the bottom one. Mm -hmm. In my notes, it's telling me that this is the one that's, uh, that's then, this one's doing the main job of, of doing most of the copying, right? These are huge chunks. In the leading strand, it's these guys. So yes, sigma, and it should be, and it should be three. Yeah. And then what does DNA polymerase two do? Three? What does the second one do? The second one, I feel like it's in DNA damage repair. But I think we're gonna go more into heavily into that one for uh, for the next lecture. Thank you. So it's going to help us with uh, editing and proofreading. You know the things we were talking about today? They're going to be involved in that kind of stuff. They'll be cutting out little fragments. So they have more exonuclease activity, right? They need to take out nucleotides. Um, and then they'll kind of like take something out and they'll fill in the spot that they need out. You know? But for this process, it's one and three are the big players. And uh, uh, epsilon, delta, and then um, I think the alpha helps with the primates at the beginning. It does a little piece of DNA. So it's not the 
Polymerase one that's filling stuff in. So polymerase one is when we're talking about bacteria. Uh, alpha is when we're talking about us. Yeah. Any other questions? All right. I think that's it. Then we're good to go. Awesome. Thank you.